Absolutely. Um, it's a blessing to be here with everyone tonight. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed and, and honored to have the um, opportunity to get to preach, um, but also just to look at word the word with uh, people around the world. What a blessing that is. Uh, I've been thinking a lot about this and what a unique opportunity. Um, when, when Johnny Guthrie called me and, and we talked for a little while, um, and I appreciate the opportunity. I, I I look forward uh, to any time getting to speak, but especially such a unique situation as this. Uh, it's a big blessing in my life, and I, and I want to know that this worship service has meant uh, a whole lot to me. But tonight, as we look at our lesson, as we kind of dive in uh, to God's Word here, one thing that I always tell the youth here, um, as uh, I begin teaching their classes and I began my work uh, at the beginning of June, one of the things I try to always remind them, um, that I really try to just constant something that I constantly say to them is that the best life that they can live is in Christ. Um, we get the idea of in Christ from um, Ephesians and Colossians. Um, that's what we had studied for uh, uh, the few months that I've been here. Um, and we've looked through just starting from chapter one, verse one of Ephesians, and we've worked all our way uh, to the end of Colossians now. And time and time again, what you see in these two books um, are little phrases of in him, you see in Christ, you see um, because of Christ, and you see all these um, words alluding to the fact that these things can be found in Christ. We should have a life that is in Christ, uh, and so I try to always remind them um, of a, the life in Christ is the best life to live. Why is it the best life to live? And when we kind of discuss that, it's because in Ephesians, it talks about Christ has a love that's so great that it can't even be measured. The height and the width and the depth and the length, not, none of it can be um, measured. And what a comforting kind of feeling that is to be in that. But also, when you look at the peace that surpasses all understanding in Philippians, and when you look at the words of Paul that have really shaped my life, and I know have shaped uh, many Christians' lives, um, you start to see that what a great life to live when it's in Christ. Uh, when you read about in Colossians and Ephesians, the debt that Christ has paid for us, that we no longer have to bear the burdens of our sins and try to um, do whatever we can to get out of sin's harm, even though we, we, we couldn't. Christ paid that. Christ did something that we could have never done. He paid a debt that was so overwhelming that we couldn't have even spent a life uh, trying to correct it. And as I say that, um, I'm always reminded of a buddy of mine who preaches, and he always says, you know, the greatest life to live is in Christ, but it's not without um, its conflicts. It's not um, the easiest life to live. It's the best one, but not the easiest one. Um, and what he means by that is, is, as many of us know, and as many of us are going to know as time goes on, there's a lot of struggle in the Christian life. There's a lot of struggle being misrepresented by society and by culture as a whole and by the world is, is being misrepresented or being mistreated because we believe in Christ. Um, and so there's not without being in Christ, there's not, not without its struggles, not without um, somewhat of a di disciplining process of, of God. And so with that idea in mind, um, I think of there's a book that was written and, and the book kind of premises the idea of there's five reasons that um, all scholars, you know, no matter what they believe about Christ or, or anything about the Bible, just simply stating that they are Christians, that they believe Christ is the Son of God. Uh, they say that there's five reasons um, that they can all agree uh, no matter what. No matter what they believe, they can all believe uh, these five facts about um, Christ being resurrected. Um, and so two of the facts are, are pretty interesting. It's the fact that Paul uh, used to persecute the church um, and was totally against Christian um, thinking and Christian beliefs. Uh, he, he killed those who professed Christ, yet he turned into the one being persecuted later on in his life. Uh, and you look at uh, Jesus' brother James as he wrote a book in the New Testament, and you see that he was a skeptic uh, in the, at the beginning of his life. But as we read in, in, in the book of James, he very much switches over to being fully um, believing in Christ 
and he's fully committed uh, to Christ. And so he ends up being persecuted. And so it's like, what's so, what's so great about being in Christ? If this life is so great, if it's um, something that's pursued by so many people, or whether it's worth a lot, it's whether it's worth um, being mis- misrepresented for, or being mistreated for, or, or backstabbed, or whatever culture and society in the world are going to throw at us. If, if there's so much that seems to stack against the Christian life, then why, um, why live it? Why be in Christ? Why you find yourself in Christ? And so I think that there's several benefits this morning that we're going to look at of why that life is so good um, to live, why it's so rewarding, why it's so benefit, beneficial, um, and what those benefits are. In Philippians, as I, as I mentioned, um, in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 27, to kind of give that text context, um, Paul is, is reaching out to this congregation in Philippi, and he's re- reaching out to this church in uh, the Philippian church, and he's encouraging them. He's giving them motivation to keep pursuing Christ, to keep pushing, to, to, to find Christ. And even though he's gone through his own struggles, even though uh, he mentioned that he's in prison, and that can be such a negative thing, that can be such a, uh, a thing that a lot of people would look down on. That's a circumstance that not a whole lot of people would be happy uh, to be in, is not to have their freedom in life. Um, as you look in Philippians, and as Paul says, he says, yeah, I might be in prison, I I might be kind of in a terrible situation as everyone would look at it, and and I could be super negative about the situation. Paul says, what's great about this is Christ is being being shared. Even though I'm in prison, everyone knows why I'm in prison. I'm not in prison because I broke the law necessarily, or or I did something against society's rules, or or I, you know, whatever the case might be. But he was he was in prison because because he was proclaiming Christ. He was he was sharing the good news that is so good to us even two thousand years later after Christ's death. And so when you look in Philippians chapter one, starting in verse twenty seven, you get this idea that that, that Paul um, understands that this situation isn't all bad. And so in verse twenty seven, he goes on to say, "Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ." So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God. Um, I found encouragement this week as I looked into this verse, um, and it mentions the fact that when Paul was in prison, Uh, it didn't seem like he had a whole lot of fear. It didn't seem like he had a whole lot of fear of the future or what was to come. He didn't seem like he had a whole lot of fear about the persecution or the mistreatment that he might get. He wasn't worried about um, the loss of freedom. It didn't seem like he was worried about all these outside factors that I I know I personally would probably have been um, concerned about and worried about family and friends and, and all the relationships that I had. But Paul is so concerned about the gospel. He's concerned about others' faith, even while in prison. That Notice he says, this is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation and that from God uh, in verse 28. We can be fearless servants. And I think that's the little snippet that I draw out of here as, as I gain this encouragement from Paul that, that everything we do as Christians is going to go against the grain. Everything that we do as Christians, if we're trying to be radically different from the world, if we're trying to separate ourselves from the world, what we're going to be left with is going, going against the grain. And I, and I know personally from my life, um, it would have, it's tough, um, and even in high school and when I was younger, when I was um, in a youth group and a part of a youth group, um, it was trying to find out who I was. Like, where did I fit in? Where was my identity? What group did I fit in with? And a lot of the um, struggle, I think, came with, okay, what do I look like? Like, what do I, what does my um, kind of resume look like to people when they look at me and when they meet me, when they talk to me? Like, we always want to leave a great impression uh, for people. 
And so I was really concerned about that in my life and, and playing soccer and that being kind of a big part of who I was. I, I wanted to make sure that I was starting. I wanted to make sure that I was practicing and training as hard as I could and, and, and doing everything I needed to do um, to, to win the first spot. And so I was so concerned about myself that, that I wasn't concerned necessarily about maybe other people or um, other things. And so, you know, we can kind of become self-centered when it comes to the gospel a little bit and that we're fearful of what the world's going to say about us when we try to pro proclaim Christ and we try to share the good news. Sometimes there's a struggle within this world and between Christians in this world to, to be fearless servants, like Paul talks about here in, in, in Philippians. Because he says in verse 29, for it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. So it doesn't just come about talking about Christ. It's not good enough um, to just kind of put ourselves out there when it's convenient or we feel safe or we feel comfortable, but pushing to be uncomfortable, pushing to be uncomfortable in this world and to share Christ and to um, share in his sufferings most literally as Paul talks about here. And so it doesn't matter so much about what we look like. Um, as easy as that might be for us sometimes as, as humans and, and, you know, as much as we care about ourselves and care about those that we love, it doesn't matter um, so much about worrying about what we look like. But it matters if we represent Christ. What matters is how we represent Christ and how Christ is seen um, throughout this world. And as Paul could have been self-centered, he, he, he was not that way. Even though he was unfairly treated and all these um, unfair things were happening in life, as, as we probably all of us know how unfair life can be, um, he was still a fearless servant. He was still fearless. And so are we fearless in serving Christ? Are we fearless in showing others um, Christ? No matter the situation that we're in, because when we look at it and we look at, um, as we just partook in the communion and as we thought about Christ and his suffering and, and everything that he went through on our behalf and the debt that he paid for each of us, it's phenomenal to think how that is still good news 2,000 years later. And if the news was all about positivity and if we could turn into the news and it not be so negative all the time, I still think a headliner would be the fact that, that Christ died on the cross. That our good news, our news that we need to be broadcasting and sharing with everyone is still good, even though it's 2,000 years later um, in the 21st century. That Christ still died for us, um, and he went on that cross for our behalf. And so instead of fearing suffering and fearing whatever might come in this life, even though that's 100% going to happen, as Paul talks about here and as Paul saw throughout his entire life, we should be fearless in serving Christ because it's what we have in Christ that's so important. Um, Paul, later on, or actually earlier in the verse, uh, in the section of cha in, in chapter 1 of Philippians, in verse 21, he says, For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And so Paul has this more positive outlook on such a gloomy and, and terrible situation so what do we have to fear when Christ has already won the battle over sin? What do we have to fear and, and, and not being fearless servants for Christ and not being those who are not held down by our fear necessarily that let our fear kind of crumble uh, on us and, and crumble us into being kind of not wanting to share the gospel because we're concerned about how people might um, react or what people might say or what people might do because we're acting differently. We're trying to be lights in this dark world. We can't allow our fear to kind of crumble us and put us into a corner and not allow us to go out uh, and to be the Christians that Christ has called us to be. But we have to take that little bit of fear that we might have, that Paul might have had in his situation, and know that, that 110% we have a leg to stand on. We have firm ground to stand on because the truth is in Christ. And, and what Christ did for us, he extended to the whole world, and he wants to make that possible for everyone. And so when we think about being fearless servants, we can be that because of uh, another benefit that we that is found in Christ. And it's the joy that Paul seems to find in this situation. Um, if you recall in Acts, 
He's in prison once again, you know, kind of a reoccurring theme here. And Paul is in prison. And what does he do instead of just kind of being doom and gloom and then this terrible situation locked up? They sing. And he spreads the gospel once again. And so there's this joy, there's this contentment in life, no matter what the situation is. And, and a lot of people, and I know for myself, and I know in the world, people are looking for happiness. People are looking for what makes them happy, what makes them feel um, fulfilled in life, and what makes them feel like they've been successful uh, in life. And they're looking for something, and oftentimes we can find ourselves looking for something that's so temporary, this happiness that only lasts for so long. Um, and it can satisfy us for a little bit. And yeah, we might be happy in life. We might be happy uh, with our job or our family or, or, or whatever's going on in our lives. We might be happy at that season of life. But in another season of life, another part of life, that happiness might not be there. Happiness kind of seems like a, a fleeting thing. Um, when I think about joy, I think about how uh, there's a preacher a uh, friend of mine, and, and he, through, you know, some of the struggles that I've had maybe with ministry or, or, or dealing with uh, certain people within the church or whatever the situation might be, the difficulty I'm going through, he's asked me several times, he goes, all right, if you could name your top five um, people that you looked up to most in the Bible, who would they be? Who would they be? Who would you think that, that your top five are? And and uh, at first I was like, well, of, of course, number one is Jesus. Like I, I you know, of course, that's going to be my priority. And, and hopefully all of our priorities, and, and I labeled him number one. But then following that, I was like, you know what, Paul, I would say Paul's a good uh, second option. And my third option, um, I would say has, you know, probably David and, and the struggles that he went through. And then I think about Peter and I think about Job. And so I kind of listed off my five um maybe people I look up to most in scripture or uh, feel like I have somewhat of a connection with them from scripture and what they've gone through in their life. And what he always told me when I told him, Hey, these are my you know, top five from, from scripture. He said, you have something in common with each and every one of these men in the Bible. He says, you have something in common in the fact that these guys were misrepresented. They were mistreated all for trying to do the right thing. And though there's going to be struggle in life and in the Christian life and everything's not always going to be happy and we're not always going to be uh, feeling maybe like the greatest uh, season in our life. Even though these guys and I can relate with each of these five guys that I listed off, these five men from the Bible. And as much as I appreciate and how, and how comfort I felt, how much comfort I felt, um, just knowing that, you know what, there are people in the Bible who have dealt with this before, and look how their faith turned out. I thought about it more, and I was like, well, I also, I don't want it just just be the hardships that I relate, relate that, on them with, but I also want it to be the joy that they found in God or they found in Christ. I want to be able to re relate with them on that, the kind of joy that's not necessarily determined by my circumstance, but determined by Christ. Not so much determined about whether I'm in a valley of life and my life is just terrible and everything around me seems to be falling apart and I'm struggling with relationships and I'm struggling with my job or I'm struggling with um, uh, an illness in my family or cancer or whatever it might be. I noticed in each of these men that I listed off, and if you can look at so many more throughout the Bible, but that they went through hardships, yes, and we can connect to that, but also... I think that I want to be able to connect with their joy and their contentment in life, not because of the situation that determined the way that they were living or the way or the outcome that they were going to have or the way that they were going to feel about life because it was all doom and gloom and it just seemed terrible, but that even in the worst, but even in the best situations, their joy was determined by Christ. And, and what a comfort that seems to hold. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, uh, in verses 23 and 28, you kind of get a snippet of what Paul has gone through in his life. Um, and, and though we looked at Philippians and that is, you know, a, a terrible situation where, where Paul is uh, imprisoned or in house arrest, however you want to look at it. There's a list of things in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of what Paul went through. Um, 
And he mentions that he went through countless beatings. He went through a ton of imprisonments, near-death experiences. Uh, at five times, he received at the hands of the Jews 40 lashes, uh, less one. Three times he was beaten with rods. Uh, once he was stoned. Three times he was shipwrecked. A night and a day he drifted at sea, a frequent journey in danger from rivers, in danger from robbers, um, in danger from uh, his own people, uh, from Gentiles, and from the city, and the wilderness, and sea, in danger from false brothers. Uh, he toiled in hardship. He had sleepless nights. He hungered and thirsted. Uh, he was without food. He was exposed to the elements. Um, and there was the daily pressure. I love this verse at the end because it really is like, okay, this is, this is my priority. Like, this is what's most important. He says, in verse 28, and, and apart from other things, there is a daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Um, I'm, I'm sure that many of us, whether we're ministers within the church, elders, deacons, um, whether we, whatever role we fit, um, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever role we fit within the church as a member or however we serve, um, there's going to be times when we love the church so much that we might have this kind of same anxiety um, as Paul did. I know as a youth minister, there's sometimes I'm anxious because I, I want kids to make the right decisions. I want teens to make the right decisions. I want them to see Christ in the big picture and not get so focused on, on the moment right now and get caught up in the momentum of the world, but to get caught up in the momentum of the kingdom of God and what's going on um, within other Christians' lives and what's going on within their life and their faith. Um, and I feel some of that anxiety that Paul is talking about. However much that what he was worried about that or concerned about that, uh, he can say that no matter what the circumstance was, he was content. He found joy. He found contentment. He found peace in Christ, regardless of the situation um, in life. And that joy, we can find it in Christ, sets us up for an even greater benefit of serving Christ that Paul prays about in Ephesians chapter 1. And this kind of last um, benefit that I want to talk about uh, this morning in looking at Paul's life and, and, and how he found benefit in serving Christ comes from something that he was praying about for the church in Ephesus. Um, they're struggling from a conflict on the outside, maybe kind of coming in and infiltrating the church and the way that culture was and all the thoughts and what people thought about with Christ. And so Paul opens up this letter and begins praying. And as we uh, read this morning, there's three things that he prays about. Uh, one of them is knowledge, that they would know the knowledge of God. One of them is prayer or power. Um, that they would have the power of God, and lastly, um, the hope of Christ. And notice in verse 18, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And so this hope is not a hope of, I, I hope this is going to happen. What Paul is praying about is not something that he hopes or he wishes or, or it might come true or it might not come true. I know when I think of that imbalance, I think about me meeting my wife and, and me trying to take her on that first date and press her and, and wanting to go on more dates with her. And, you know, I was all in. I was 100 percent like I want to take her on another date. I want this to be this relationship to go somewhere. And I, it's kind of uncertain, right, because it's all up to her at that point. If I ask her to go on a date or if I asked her out or whatever, it's kind of all up to her. I was hoping that she would. Um, say yes, or I was hoping that she would want to go on a second date with me. Um, but that was a hope of it's out of my control, and it's completely in someone else's control. And the kind of hope that Paul is talking about here um, is the hope of, <clears throat> is a hope of um, certainty. It's a hope that this is, is absolutely um, going to happen. Um, that this is is 100%. If we put our hope in heaven is the kind of hope that Paul is talking about. It's going to happen when we are in Christ and we are serving him. It's it's 100%. It's guaranteed. No one can take it away. No one can steal it. Uh, when Jesus talks about moth and rust destroying things, if we put our treasures here on earth, that, that's not going to happen. Because what Christ says in Matthew chapter 7 there is that if we put our treasure in heaven, Moth and rust and disaster and, 
and, and life and time, none of those things are going to destroy what's in heaven. Because what we have in heaven is that hope that Paul talks about here in, in, in Ephesians chapter 1, is a hope that is certain, 100% certain, that at the end of the day, if we have served, if we have spent our whole life serving Christ, doing everything we can to be a Christ follower and to serve him and to proclaim him and to share the good news and to be the Christians that Christ wants us to be, there's a hope waiting for us at the end of the day. There's a song, and I'll end with this. There's a song that I listen to, and it's, and it's titled Cemetery. Um, and the idea is kind of a story of this guy who um, is in life, and he's trying to be successful. He's trying to um, have all this money and have all this fame and get all this uh, status and reputation and all of these things. He's trying to achieve all these great things in life. Um, and it kind of gives the story of this man's life. And once you get to the chorus of this song, it says um, that this man died, the richest man in the cemetery. And it's kind of ironic because it says that he didn't have time to spend with his family. He didn't have time to spend with what should have been the most important part of his life. But he died, the richest man in the cemetery. All this wealth and all this fame and all this uh, all the status that he might have received and the house that he might have had and the car he might have drove and whatever reputation he had with, with uh, co-workers or friends or whatever that looked like didn't mean anything because you can't treasure those things above, like Christ says. And so his priority was set on things here that would eventually, with time, deteriorate or with his life, eventually... Um, would not exist. And so, therefore, he's kind of left with nothing. He's left the richest man in the cemetery. So, if we place our hope and our treasure where no one can steal this hope, nothing can destroy what we have in eternal life. No one can take it away. No movement in this world can take it away. But if we focus our eyes on God, um, there's a hope that we can 100% have, a, have an eternal relationship with Christ for the rest of our lives. And that's the greatest thing. Yeah, we, yeah heaven is described with, with uh, golden roads and, and these pearly gates and all these magnificent things that blow our minds and we can't even think about. I think the greatest thing about that hope that we have in Christ is that there's going to be a relationship forever uh, spent with Christ in eternity. And so the question I want to leave everyone with and to challenge everyone's life with is, is it worth serving Christ to you? What's it worth to serve Christ? Is it worth all these benefits? Is it worth maybe some of the struggle and some of the hardship and some of the uh, unfairness of life that's going to happen simply because we are a Christian? Um, I think so. Um, but a life in Christ is the best life that we can, that we can uh, live. And so this morning, I want to leave y'all with the invitation. The invitation is open to y'all. Um, if there's anybody that hasn't obeyed the gospel or hasn't, um, you know, professed that they need to repent and that they need to be baptized and they want to enter into salvation um, because of what Christ did for us and wants to be uh, resemble in baptism, that death, burial, and resurrection, you can make it known Um uh, that there are elders and there are ministers here that would love to talk with you. There's people here that would love to talk to you about that. Or if there's prayers that you need of, of the people here, the, the church here, of all these Christians here, um, you can be, let it be known as, uh, as, as I extend the invitation to you and as we sing um, these songs.